Check one two check. Check one two. Check one two check. And he would end up taking off to Florida, of course. So, yeah. I'm curious. How did you get in contact with Kurt's grandpa? Well, that was, yeah, it, that, it wasn't hard. But the interesting thing about, about interviewing uh, Leland, Leland Cobain, is that I think a lot of the biographies and a lot of the narrative around Kurt's early years talked about how he spent a lot of time with his uh, grandparents. But they always talked about how his grandparents lived in a trailer park. When people hear trailer park, they have this like, you know, this stereotype of trailer trash, right? And a lot of trailer parks are certainly really fit those stereotypes. I was just in northern Florida and saw Trump flags and Confederate flags in this really <laughs> seedy trailer park. And but so we we had this like stereotype that Leland and Kurt had spent a lot of time as a child with his grandparents at the trailer park. So we pictured not only the grandparents, but Kurt in a little bit as a bit trailer trashy. So we show up at the, you know, Leland, the, the grandmother had already died. Leland. She, she is, adored Kurt. I know and, that. And, and adored Kurt adored him. her. But we show up for the interview and it's this pristine, you wouldn't even know these are trailers. Officially they are, but they look more like bungalows, very uh, manicured lawns. There's a golf cart in every driveway. It's a very respectable middle-class uh, community. And so right away, you know, stereotypes go out the window, knock on the door. Leland is very kind, very friendly. He shows us artwork, you know, from when Kurt was five years old. He talks about Kurt. Kurt's relationship with the, with his wife, especially, I think her name was Iris. Um, and it was, it was heartwarming. And so, you know, we got, we, we definitely got a lot of insight about Kurt as a child. And uh, you hear about Kurt's miserable childhood after the divorce and all that stuff. But really, like you see these photos and, and his artwork and some of his, I think he had like, you know, school papers and things like that, that he showed us. It, it yeah. gave us a lot of insight into into Kurt, just like when Hank Harrison showed us Courtney's early writings and poems that gave us a lot of insight into her personality. But the, the thing I remember the most is asking him whether he was a Nirvana fan. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, and he said, no, nah, it's all noise until until that MTV Unplugged album. And then I finally could hear the words. And you know what? Kurt actually was pretty talented. <laughs> he had a revelation. He just assumed yeah. that what is this punk rock noise? And and so I think just very we didn't even know that he believed the murder theory. This is we were just looking for early biographical insights into into Kurt as a child. Right. And then right. he volunteers it. He says, I think we said, Oh, what 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 do you uh think of the the he was a hunter, right? A lot of people in that rural washington state or hunters and he, he knew a lot about guns so all of a sudden he goes on and on about the gun evidence and he's like you know been i don't know if he's been following tom grant's uh conclusions but he uh he was absolutely adamantly convinced that kurt didn't kill himself uh the, and that he was murdered it's like oh who do you think did it oh everybody knows it's courtney <laughs> Just like that, right? So I think people know that Hank Harrison went around talking about how his daughter killed Kurt. But yeah. a lot of people don't, yeah. don't know that the grandfather also believes that, that Courtney did it, right? And he was very knowledgeable. I remember going on Ted Nugent. You know, I, I, I confess that I had a Ted Nugent album when I was a teenager, Cat Scratch Fever, and that I liked that music. And years later, when all this was uh, going on, he had he had a radio show. He probably still does, and he um, he's a gun nut, right? So he had us on the the show, and he went on and on. Same thing with it, like the grandfather. He knew guns, 
and he was absolutely convinced that that Kurt didn't kill himself. It was impossible for the from the forensic gun evidence. And at that time, it was like, wow, this this guy has credibility. And now he's like one of the biggest nut jobs in America, and nobody would take him seriously. So you're not going to say, well, oh, Ted. Nugent. I flipped out on Ted Nugent. He has a YouTube channel, and he's he made a really terrible statement about uh, Dave Grohl's drummer Taylor Hawkins. Yeah. He passed away. He made some terrible statements about him, and I flipped out on Ted Nugent. Uh, yeah, I'm not a fan. Yeah. But at one point, you know, he was a respected musician. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, not, not such a nut job, right? I, I think he was always a a gun guy and a bit right wing. But at that yeah. time, again, it's a very it was a very different landscape. You know, that era compared to now. Right now, right. I don't think anything Ted Nugent takes uh, says seriously, although probably tens of millions of people do. Oh yeah, for sure. He was a nice guy. I know that uh, Kurt's he's uncle, very sweet. Yeah, that that's the impression I got from the the clips I've seen of him. He he just seems like a like like a sweet old grandpa, you know. That's uh, exactly what he was. Papa yeah. Leland, you know. <laughs> you know, hanging out with these people gives you gave gave us insight, I guess, into into those early years, right? Doesn't sure. really touch on the on any of the investigation or the murder theory, but gave us insight into Kurt himself. Do you remember exactly what about the gun? Was it the no fingerprints or the shell being on one side? Yeah, that was just mainstream by that time. Everybody was saying that. We were saying that. Tom Grant was saying that. I'm yeah. talking about way more technical stuff, things that I don't even understand. At one point, I guess we we delved into it did, in our box, right? Did did you uh, have you ever uh, watched seen the interview with Detective Chizinski, who was responsible? Basically, you guys, all your work, and, and Tom and Soaked and Bleach. Seattle gets nervous. They reopen the case. And um, then Chazinski's on the scene, right? Uh, have you ever seen the interview where he says, I talked to a weapons expert and they explained to me uh, the physics of how the shell could have ended up on the wrong side, but he never explains it. He just right. says, I talked to somebody and they said it could happen. Yeah. You know, there's <laughs> people that will tell you and they're not lying that, that, uh, oh, I know, uh, I know a heroin addict that says they could have taken that dose of heroin and and still not been unconscious, picked up a shotgun, stuck in the mouth, cleanly put, put away the gun kit and then shot himself. That would have been easy. They'll say that, but it's easy to make that claim, right? First of all, they don't even understand the science. Very few people do. It's forensic pathologists who understand the science, who have reviewed right. thousands and thousands of drug deaths and say, it's impossible. There's no cases like that, right? So, but it's easy to make those claims. And again, you're not lying. They don't, they don't know those details, right? So they just know they have a very high tolerance or their friend who's a junkie had a very high tolerance. So it's not outside their own possibility. I, I'm not a junkie. I, almost I didn't feel... hang in those circles. I don't understand that, that science, but I, I consult with, you know, a variety of experts. I played and I started playing in rock bands myself when I was 13. By the time I'm 15, 16, I'm playing in college bars. So I did this whole, you know, underground thing and and, and I've had experience. It, it is true that a lot of musicians, a lot of creative people end up going down that road. And I've heard that just like you're talking about. I've heard people say this and it's almost like a badge of honor. Like I could handle that much. You know, right. it's like, come on, man. But have you ever done that much? Uh, no, probably not. But I could handle it, right. you know. Well, tolerance is a thing, right? So at first we were very confused about that. And we did a lot of investigation. We had, and, you know, Yeah, we, and we've had uh, uh, just FBI people. Nobody with any credibility said this is possible. They all said the same thing. Really? Impossible. They all I, say he wouldn't have died. But he would have been almost instantly unconscious after taking that yes. kind of from a shot, right? So yes. that that's that was pretty convincing. But that's I, when, when I asked uh, when Doctor Weck was on the channel and I asked him about this, he laughed. He said, "You know, people can say what they want, but I've been doing this for years. It, 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 this is unheard of, you know." So that's what really convinced me, right? Uh, and if it was uh, just zero whacked, right? He's a bit of a he's got an ego yeah, of his own, I, yeah, a narcissist, it, right? It, it so, could depend yeah. on who you talk to, but that he, coupled he, with he's, Rosemary, he's Carol, big at uh, celebrity conspiracy theories or yeah, murder. So I and, I and I get that. I, I get that. But a lot of store, he definitely gives the case a little more credibility. And soaked and beat bleach was a very powerful film. 
with a lot of convincing evidence, right? But so, you know, if it was just your wet, I would I, I might roll my eyes, but when I've talked to many other forensic pathologists who all say the exact same thing long before Cyril Weck said that, that yeah. gives it more credibility. Right, right. Cameron, Detective Cameron, you you talked to him, didn't you? Or you well, attempted sort of. to? So, so here's the story about uh, Nick Broomfield and Kirk and Courtney. He, he hires us. Our book hadn't come out yet, but we were on the speaking tour with Hank Harrison. We got a lot of publicity around the world. We were giving, you know, radio interviews, and uh, we get a call from Nick Broomfield. Nick Broomfield's one of the most respected documentary filmmakers in history. He was Michael yeah. Moore before Michael Moore. Yeah. And he had been a, a, a juror on the Sundance Film Festival jury, right? This guy is really well-respected. I've seen some of his films. And he says, oh, I'm I'm uh, doing this uh, documentary about, about uh, Kurt Cobain's death. Um, I hear you're very knowledgeable. And uh, he flies us to Seattle, pays us to be a consultant. And he's he's very uh, famous. We reviewed some of his previous films. He's famous for ambushing people and trying to make them look uh, stupid. One of his famous films about Heidi Fleiss. I think he uh, he had he, he bribed a, a, a police officer and had the police officer counting the bribe on film, right? Which is a very powerful <laughs> uh, statement about police corruption. But so we were very suspicious. We were going to show up at the airport and he was going to ambush us to try to make us look foolish. He was probably doing a, a film about all the crazy conspiracy theorists involved in this case, right? Yeah. So we were very wary. Originally, the project started off as being kind of going back to that part going to Portland, meeting some of those bands like Napalm Beach and going through some of the musical influences of, of Kurtz. And we started off making that film. You know, we inter did interviews with Napalm Beach and some other bands in Portland. So according to Broomfield, the original documentary was supposed to just be about Kurtz origins, his influences and that whole music scene. He wanted to make a documentary about how Nirvana became Nirvana. Now, I'm not saying that Wallace is blowing smoke up your ass or he's wrong because after all why would nick broomfield hire max wallace as a consultant for kurt and courtney unless he was sort of into the conspiracy thing right but at the same time wallace told me the investigation was sort of incognito they were they were stealthing you know metal gear soliding their way to these people and not telling them what they were really investigating what they were really trying to find out it's Kind of confusing to me. How does Broomfield know that Wallace is investigating a murder theory when he's doing his investigations on the hush hush? It's obviously at some point Broomfield finds out Wallace is not only very knowledgeable about Cobain, he's also very knowledgeable about Courtney and the circumstances around Kurt's death and, you know. Because he's right, Broomfield is known for sort of ambushing people and making them look a little stupid, like he did to Hank Harrison and Eldon Hoke, El Duce. I don't think he killed himself. I think that somebody killed him. It's your daughter. Oh. Someone's father, own father, is saying that maybe his daughter is a, is a murderer. I don't know if she works inside. I've got an inside track on her mind. I told her that from the beginning. You did some deal with Courtney, right? Yeah. Well, she offered me 50 grand to whack Kurt Cobain. Okay, so just to make this clear, Wallace is telling us he thought that Nick Broomfield might have been making a documentary about all the crazy conspiracy theorists who are you know doing things like writing books about Kurt Cobain's death. Broomfield doesn't say anything about that although I'm not setting that idea aside because I happen to know that the Kurt and Courtney that you and I have watched the one that the world watched actually had a different ending. It had a whole different edit and the BBC would not allow the original ending to be seen. The original conclusion to Kurt and Courtney, the conclusion that Nick Broomfield came to, was that indeed Courtney Love had something to do with Kurt Cobain's murder. But the BBC, who had given Nick a million pounds to make this documentary, decided we're not going to roll with that. You have to make a different ending. And oh, it would be better if you ended it with saying more than likely he took his own life and Courtney had nothing to do with it. That's the conclusion that you and I have both watched. But that is not the conclusion that Nick Broomfield came to. It was the one that he was forced 
to use. That dude did everything on film. I know he's still got those reels. I would love to see the original ending of Kurt and Courtney. Unless you become good friends with Nick Broomfield, you're probably never going to watch it. Now, Broomfield never mentions the making a film about conspiracy theorists, but it may have been at one point in time. In a recent interview, and by recent, I mean more recent than the 90s, Broomfield did an interview with Rolling Stone to which he said it changed from Nirvana band bio to this. By the time we got to Seattle, Courtney had heard about it and um, already we'd lost part of our funding. I think MTV pulled out. So it sort of became a different film. It became like a film about why someone was trying to stop the film happening. And well, in a way, it became a more interesting film. I think, you know, Courtney started defining the film then, which was kind of like, what part did she have in his end game kind of thing? So, but we show up at the airport. He meets us at the airport with his crew and he does film us getting off the plane and, but nothing particularly untoward, but we were still, we had a sense that, that he wanted to make us look foolish. So we were always on our best Because that's what he does, right? <laughs> exactly. So, but, you know, we were genuine consultants, but we were also going to be in the film. He interviewed us a lot. We were going to be players in this film, which is one of the reasons we were suspicious. He was going to edit his footage to make us look foolish. And, you know, Hank Harrison comes off really, really badly in that film, right? Because that's exactly what he did to Hank. He ambushed him. If 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 you you know go back and watch that film and you watch what he did to Hank, a lot of people's image of Hank Harrison is from the scene in Kirk and Courtney, right? Right. And I think this guy's a, a a jackass, a buffoon, and so we uh, so he's bringing us around to all these sites and we're introducing him to what we had for our book, which hadn't come out yet, and um, he uh, he says, oh, let's go to the police station. Let's uh, let's let's uh, get this uh, Cameron to uh, to talk about the case. He's the homicide. So he's detective. just going to take his camera right in the police station. That's exactly what he did. We walked in, so he had us as the front people. He was just the camera. He he does his own sound, and he's got his cameraman and him following us in. And we go up to the desk, and we say uh, uh, we'd like to speak to uh, uh, Detective Cameron. And uh, the, the woman at the desk, the receptionist says, oh, I'll, I'll get him. So she goes back. We see a little, a little cubicle. She, we, we see him come out and he looks at us and he looks at the camera and he uh, he ducks. He hides behind wow. this. He goes, but, like dives back into his cubicle to avoid us and the camera. And that was uh, we, we thought that this would Appear, it's very compelling footage and we assume this would be a highlight of uh of nick's film and then um you know the film came out and didn't have us at all and i i was a little bit relieved that we were in the film because sure enough he he was trying to make all these people look like this uh, a motley cast of characters uh, of buffoons and so, but i asked him at one point you know why why weren't we in there and he says oh I, I thought you were I thought you were going to be crazy conspiracy theorists, but I, I spent a day <laughs> with you and realized you were this respectable Canadian journalist. And that's no fun. It all ended up on the cutting room floor. Right. So it gave so a real, he, he, he uh, has like a total he could potentially make a totally different edit of that film. Well, he actually admitted to us. So he he was uh, doing the film for the BBC. He didn't work for the BBC, but he they gave him a million dollars, the equivalent of a, a million dollars US for that film. That's a lot of money back then, even today. And uh, he ends oh my up... My God, especially for such a low-budget looking film. That's intentional, the low budget. Uh, yeah, the, I, I, that's the, what I'm saying is why of, would he yeah. need a million dollars? Isn't he kind of known for sort of homemade bootleg looking because he does of... everything on film he compiles thousands of hours of film footage and edits on film rather than video right so it's very time consuming and very expensive okay uh, and he really does his homework so he um he admitted to us that you know there's a scene in that film where he sort of shifts it sounds like he's leaning towards the uh, the murder theory and then in the end, he comes out with a statement saying, oh, I, I don't believe it was murder, something like that. It's been 25 years since I saw it. 
um, he admitted to us that he had to do that uh, to satisfy the BBC lawyers. British mm. libel laws are very strict, and they were never going to um, distribute it and run it if he accused Courtney or implied that Courtney had anything to do with the death. So he had to do that. So it was very disingenuous. I, I kind of understand it. And yet, you know, all these years later, more people believe the murder theory because they watched Kurt and Courtney than any other source, including our books or including and including Tom Grant's investigations. So that was a very uh, powerful. A lot of people discarded his his, you know, dismissal mm, of the murder maybe, maybe theory that was the way and looked at maybe, the facts. Maybe it was like that for quite a while. But I've uh, personally from looking through hundreds, thousands of comments more often than not, I see people referring to soaked in bleach. Very now, rarely. Now, that's true now, now but this yeah. is like 25 years ago. Right, right. That film was one of the most successful documentaries of all time. Yes. Before and Michael Moore came along. But it made a lot of money because Courtney tried to stop it. She successfully stopped it at Sundance. It made worldwide headlines. Right. So it's true that in the beginning, it was just supposed to be shown at Sundance. It was supposed to be shown on the BBC, but it was supposed to premiere at Sundance and then it would have got a very limited uh, distribution like most of Nick Greenfield's films, but it would have been shown on the BBC. They paid for it okay. and it would have got a very substantial showing just in England. And then because it made worldwide headlines, Robert right. Redford actually he held a press conference and denounced Courtney. He said, I have no choice. She, you know, Nick Broomfield didn't have the music rights for the film, the Nirvana music. At that time, before that happened, you would see a, a film at a film festival using very famous footage. And only if they got a distributor would the distributor pay to buy the music rights. That was just standard. Right. So, th so, so up to this point, people yeah. are allowed to use copyrighted music to show they weren't allowed, but nobody, nobody, but nobody messed with deal them. Of it. But as soon as Courtney, you know, sent a lawyer's letter saying you have used unauthorized uh, Nirvana music, they had to, they, they had no choice, right? She had a legal case. I feel the need to explain because neither Max nor I did a good job of explaining in our dialogue. At independent film festivals, such as, you know, Sundance, independent filmmakers often use copyrighted music in the films. If you've ever heard me rant about all of my ad revenue being given away to copyright holders or you know anything about copyrights. If you use somebody's music, you have to pay them. You either have to license it for a certain period of time or you have to give them the ad revenue. Well, record companies had never given independent filmmakers a hard time about using copyrighted music for film festivals. They had never charged them and they had never stopped them from using it because typically the film will just be shown to 150, 200 people at a film festival and, and that's it. It's not distributed for sale. So no copyright holders had ever given any independent filmmakers a hard time until Nick Broomfield. That was Courtney's way of stopping the film. She was saying he's using copyrighted Nirvana music. So when Wallace says Robert Redford denounced Courtney, what he's saying is no one else has ever cared. No one else has ever given independent filmmakers a hard time about this. Well, screw Courtney Love, you know. But maybe Robert Redford didn't know that the film was going to be all about Courtney's suspicious behavior. And she was using that as a legal a legal way to stop Nick's film. This is what created all the buzz around the film. Then people were like, well, why is she doing this? No one's ever done this before. It's just going to be shown at a film festival. And then a distribution company's like, ooh, this just made national and international headlines. Courtney Love is doing something unheard of, unprecedented, kind of like that judge in Florida. If you remember me talking about that, it had never been done before. So that's what really created buzz around Kurt and Courtney. They ended up, well, I'll let Max finish the rest. So Nick quickly edited it out and used Dylan Carlson's music instead for the soundtrack. But And it ends up being well, promotion. The, well, as a, as a result, the distributor, a San Francisco distributor, a movie house in San Francisco, independent uh, movie house, approached him and said, we want to distribute it. And they got it out very quickly. And they sold something like a million... VHS uh, videos. It right. Was, 
hugely profitable. Nick Broomfield made millions of dollars. Documentary filmmakers before Michael Moore never made real money off their yeah. film, right? And all of a sudden he's rich because Courtney tried to stop it. So it completely that's, backfired. That's what I'm saying her. is had had she never messed with him, oh, yeah. there, there wouldn't have been those headlines. There wouldn't have been yeah. so much interest. Probably right. a lot of us would have never watched Kurt and Courtney. And maybe you know? nobody would have read our book, you know, like uh, she hired or Court or Rosemary Carroll hired this Jack Palladino guy and he showed up at our publishing house two days before publication. He shows up in the lobby and demands a meeting with a publisher and they threw him out. They got security cards to escort him out. And there was wow. a little item in New York magazine about this incident. Right. So she tried to stop our book. She threatened them. She said, we're going to I'm going to sue you. You're accusing me of murder. I'm going to sue you. But she never did. She's never sued anybody. Right. But this was the only really successful legal action she ever took. And it, it backfired. Do you have any any thoughts on why she's never sued any of you? Oh, we we know why, because the lawyers always told us whenever whenever it was vetted by lawyers, they took a look at it and said, you know, normally if it was any other celebrity, we wouldn't be able to publish this because it's completely libelous. Not that we were saying anything libelous. We were pretty objective. But Tom Grant was accusing her of murder. Other people were accusing yeah. her of murdering her husband. You can't do that. Right. And they, they they all said, oh, she has no reputation to defame. She has no case and she will She's never be on libel. Plus, she'll never show up in court and subject herself to an examination under oath, right, where she would have to perjure herself. I mean, she's admitted to taking heroin while she's pregnant. You know, this is what got her in trouble and got Francis Bean uh, taken away temporarily yeah. uh, after the Vanity Fair profile. And so, you know, every lawyer looked at that stuff and said, no problem. We were actually surprised. We thought that at some point, the lawyers would stop the, our books, but never happened. Even in England, wow. where the laws are strict, uh, the lawyers never had any hesitation just because she had no reputation to defame. Wow. Get, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get straight to the point. Um, and maybe I shouldn't... Uh, I'll edit this part out because I just want to talk to you real quick. Do you mind if I just ask you straight up, do you think Kurt Cobain was murdered? Oh, you know, after talking to because even numerous... talking to you now, like reading your book, even talking to you now, you you do a really good job of sort of seeing you you look at it from both sides, and you, and I never know right what you're thinking or or which side of the fence you're on. You know, I, I never think... had we've never had any hesitation about calling this a murder after talking to numerous forensic pathologists, FBI yeah. agents that examine the the evidence there's there's almost no question that he was murdered what we've always done is said we've seen no proof no convincing smoking gun evidence that courtney had it done right obviously she's the prime suspect she had the the motive she had the opportunity but we've not seen that smoking gun evidence and you know then tom grant says oh that's uh that's a ridiculous argument uh circumstantial evidence is is uh, powerful and he's got a point but we have to be objective right we were looking for it and we ended up shooting down a lot of the 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 crazier conspiracy theories which gave yeah. us more credibility and we tried we would have had no hesitation uh, as uh, about naming Courtney if we believed we had the evidence to back it up but one last interruption I have to say although Wallace definitely came together toward the end and really started to focus on the things that I wanted to talk about. And he, and he seems to redeem himself. I have to say that when he, when Wallace says we shot down some of the crazier conspiracy theories, he's actually talking about Alan wrench and he created that conspiracy theory. Like he created it and then he shot it down. So, you know, Still haven't seen it all these years later. Obviously, so, she's a suspect. He's mur definitely leans toward he's murdered, but no one knows who did it. Of course, and co of course, that goes back to the SPD not looking for footprints, not not looking for for right. you know they didn't do their job. So yeah, I mean, you, one thing you've I asked, always you've always called on on uh, and a lot of the more credible people following this case 
have have not, you know, they don't come out and say, arrest Courtney and throw her in jail for murdering her husband. All you've ever done, as far as I know, as far as I've ever seen, is to say this case should be reopened, right? And, yes. Yes. and you know, look at all this evidence that that's emerged. I, unfortunately, I think a lot of people won't want to hear this, but even if the case was reopened by the Seattle Police Department, or it, it, I think Tom would like to see it reopened by the FBI. That that's always been his. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Know, I, under, I understand why. But and he he even wrote enough, the FBI. He he right. even sent the FBI. You know, I don't think there's enough evidence extent to you know the only way this could really be solved is if the person that did it or that was hired to do it came forward and confessed. Right? I just don't see this case being reopened, and even if it was reopened, uh, you know, any sort of conviction happening so I, I i understand obviously it's very, very powerful for norm stamper to come out in something bleach and say ah. basically says we botched this right and th that's something people should be re-emphasizing over and over again along with the rosemary carroll stuff the serial wet conclusions there's a lot of powerful stuff to uh, pointing to the fact that the seattle police department botched this investigation and, oh absolutely and i i and that's something i've mentioned several yeah. times norm stamper said if i was police chief again i'd First thing I do is reopen this case. Right. That's pretty powerful. But even if they did, I mean, most of the evidence is gone. Right. So and and then people. That was like, my yeah. uh, question with yeah. Wecht. And of course, he does. He doesn't work for Seattle. So he didn't know. I said, well, if they still had the items that they collected from this room, wouldn't it be possible to get DNA? Just it doesn't prove anything, but maybe it could prove that someone else was touching the spoon and the syringe and the cigar. You know, it's things they could have done that they didn't do basically. And according to Wecht, he said, yeah, there would still be DNA on all those items. Now, did they give him the Courtney? Did they dispose of them? I'm just yeah. suggesting that it might open up a new uh, avenue if you if you did DNA testing on those objects. Don't hold your breath. That's all right, I mean. right, right. The, the, the thing that I'm, I've kind of come to the conclusion that, you know, maybe no one will ever come forward. But if, if, as a community, if if all Kurt Cobain fans would come together and maybe just try to get his death certificate changed from suicide to undetermined, I think that would be in itself a little bit of justice. That's you know all we saying? called for in both our books. That's what we asked for, right? We we just asked that the um, that the case be reclassified, and right, I mean, that's a reasonable. It would be nice if Frances Bean would call for that, right? I think she's the, you know, at one point there was hope that she would, you know, she was estranged from her mother. 